Hey everyone, today I'm going to be chatting with Matthew Roland Billicart, the CEO of Champagne Billicart Salon. And we're going to be tasting through two vintages of Cuvée Nicolas Francois. Hey Matthew. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Yeah, good. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Perfect. So people should start to funnel in. It's, uh, it's nine o'clock here, so six o'clock Paris. It's a bit easier, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, of all the morning tastings I've done, um, let me back this up a little bit. Uh, drinking champagne in the morning is, uh, is always the easiest. <laughs> there are harder jobs. Yeah, there are harder jobs. That's, there for are sure. to... That's for sure. Let me just pin this comment so when people join, they know who we're talking to. Okay, so um, great. So we have, uh, I have the two bottles open, ready, and uh, waiting, excited to talk through those. Uh, but uh, I was wondering if you could give maybe a brief uh, introduction to yourself and, and Champagne Bilicar Samon. Sure. Um, so I'm Mathieu Bilcar, and I'm the seventh generation of the Bilcar family to have the privilege to lead Champagne Bilcar Samon. Um, our house was founded in 1818, so that's 202 years ago. And we were one of the very last few family owned and family run Champagne estate. Uh, we are based in a little village just off Epanay called Maro Sirai. Um, and we work for the vast majority of what we do and what we need, 20 kilometer radius around our village. Uh, that's where all the vast majority of the Premier and Grand Cru sit. And we basically focus on three main areas, Côte des Blancs for the Chardonnay, um, Montagne de Reims for the Pinot Noir, and... Um, and uh, valid man for the money because they all just literally we are at the junction point of all of this oh, okay so you but you try to keep it local to the actual uh yeah. champagne, champagne is actually is relatively speaking quite a big region and we have quite a narrow view of what champagne should be um you know it, it, we we between i don't know i don't know what geographical equivalent would be but um uh, it, it's kind of the tiny the, the hypercenter where for our style, we saw the very best, um, the very best grape that we need. We have quite a particular way of, of doing our vinification, which is based on finesse, elegance, and balance. And whilst we completely respect other winemakers that can be doing a great job in other sub-regions, for us, we take quite an historical, very high quality focus on, on the regions we, 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 we work in. And in terms of, um, so in terms of, uh, uh, Cuvées, you, you, a lot of people talk about Billicar Samon and they talk about rosé. Um, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm not sure, uh, like I've, I, I've, I've loved the rosé and I think the rosé is a benchmark in, in rosé, but, I, but I, I've loved uh, the, the white champagnes, the blanc champagnes that you guys have made uh, for many, many years. And I feel like a lot of times people associate your brand with uh, rosé for some reason, but there's so many, there's so many, all the wines are actually quite elegant and all, almost of a similar style. Thank you. We have, 11, we have 11 cuvées, so it's actually quite a lot. Um, our aim is to, other than being responsible for a natural ecosystem and a human ecosystem, we happiness sellers, right? And because there are very different tastes, your taste is different to mine, it will be different to the person next to you. Pleasure comes in different, um, different types, and that's what we decline in, in cuvées. You're quite right, I think particularly in the US, um, the rosé is kind of the one that most people know. In terms of production, it's, it's nowhere near the biggest. Okay. Uh, and the reason why you hear less to talk about these is because they are tiny productions. So right. even if, frankly, everybody wanted them, um, they, they are quite small, only produced in specific years, which makes it a little harder. Because we've, we've got very, very, very high standards for these. Um, so even when they're made, the tiny bottlings, and because they don't get made every year, then you can see why uh, there's not much point communicating too much on them. And in terms of um, the Billicar Samon style, has it changed over, I mean, it's been over the 200 years, obviously it must have, but over the last, I mean, say 50, yeah. 60 years, I mean, is that, is there, like, who set that style? Uh, so for 200 years, you're quite right. Everything has changed. Right. Um, I think one of the big difference is really happened to us in the late 60s, 70s, when my great uncle, uh, which I call Uncle Jean, um, he, he changed quite a lot of things in terms of vinification. Um, and part of the reason for that is his wife's uh, family were brewers for, from the north of France, beer brewers. 
And at the time, coming back from the war, hygiene levels were not quite the same in terms of, of vinification. Right. I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about vinification. So he brought back a level of control uh, and type of cold settling, cold fermentation, which was very, very innovative then. It's still very few people use it. It's quite labor intensive. It's quite expensive to do. So he changed, he brought, he stopped using stainless steel tanks and actually stopped using wood, which we came back to later and brought in stainless steel for better control. He brought in the cold fermentation and he was one of the one that really reshaped the rosé, moved it away from a more um, he arguably heavier uh, with tannins rosé, which you still see and some right. people love to a much finer version, much more, much fresher, much lighter version, which is fundamentally what you, what, what we drink today. It's changed at the margin and we continue to make very small improvement, but its DNA was really reset in the, in the 60s and 70s. And this COVID, we're gonna be tasting the uh, two vintages of uh, Cuvée Nicolas Francois. When was this started? Because this is named after the original vendor. Yeah. So I, actually that's almost as far as my great uncle, that's almost always existed. It wasn't called Nicolas Francois, it was this before. I don't know whether you can see. Yep. It was a brute vintage. So as far as we can remember, and we can see that in very, very old orders, we were doing a brute, a rosé, which was called Oeil de Perdrie, and a vintage brute. Okay. And that cuvee, this is the one that won Champagne in the Millennium and all the story. It didn't really change. It changed its name for the 150th anniversary of the house. So in 1968. But fundamentally, this is a change of label. It's okay. the same DNA. It's always been uh, Pinot Noir dominant. Uh, uh, Pinot Noir, as far as we can see in the blend books, and they go back very far. A Pinot Noir dominant uh, cuvee, largely of Grand Cru plus Maroille sur Aïe, and on or around 40% of Chardonnay. Um, from time in history, it hasn't always had um, wood vinification in it. Sometimes, very, very historically, it almost had only that. Then it moved to none of that. And now we're back into a mix of both. Got it. Um, but the fundamental equilibrium is one of these cubes, arguably, whilst nature has changed, maturity level have changed, things like that have changed quite a lot. In its blend, I would say it's one of the ones that vary the least. Um, vintage characteristics, maturity levels, um, change of vinification method, uh, control, our ability to control temperature, aging on lees, getting much longer. That's, I would say, newer, but its DNA hasn't changed that much. So, and in terms of this blend, so it's always been kind of like 60, 40, or roughly yeah. that, but no Pinot Munien. Is that because uh, you're going for uh, Premier Cru, Grand Cru uh, sites, and therefore there's not as much Pinot Meunier in those sites? Well, there isn't Pinot Meunier in Premier Right, Grand right, Cru. right. There isn't. Right. If, if you take our definition of valid Marne, it's, but it's not the reason. So we one of the houses that for a long time Pinot Meunier was really the kind of poor cousin and people didn't like it. Uh, we disagree and we've always yeah. been strong defender of Meunier and it's always been our largest proportion in our Brut Reserve. However, you have to look at the strength and weaknesses of, of a grape. One of the strengths of Meunier is it brings fruitiness. It matures early, which used to be an advantage. It's less, less of an advantage now. Um, but it brings fruitiness. However, that fruitiness fades over time. Got it. If you're going to have a wine that's going to age four, five years, six years, let's, let's push it to 10. Might, might be fine. That's got an aging potential of 30 years. Right. So it's no longer, by the time I release it, that's, that's very likely to start to decline. Where when I want to ship it, I want the wine to be early this drinking window and then continue to go that way. Okay, so you're trying to, get, you're trying to release it right at, at the pinnacle of its drinking window, just going into its drinking window. Yeah, at the start of its primary drinking window. And then it will go through several phases. And the reason why we do that, and you will notice we are one of the longest aging uh, house when it comes to this prestige, you know, 2002 is a current release at Belcar Salmon. It's not yeah. an Ernotec stuff. And, and the vast majority of premium cuvées are, I think vast majority have moved to 12 now. They've yeah, finished yeah. the eight. I haven't started releasing my eight. 
Yeah, uh, not, a lot of people released the nines, then they went to the eights. Um, yeah. yeah, I haven't, I haven't started. Yeah, have you, and the seven is the six. The, the 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 is the seven's not even on the market yet, right? No, because we're on the six. Okay. Yeah, we're on the six. Six, six, and two. We keeping side by side, and we'll talk about it later because we feel they have different characteristics and arguably they appeal to different people depending on the kind of drinker you are and fundamentally how patient you're going to be. Got it. Uh, and that very much varies because your uh, patience or your desire to age champagne may appeal to you, but some other people, as when we ask, when do you need it for? I need it for next week. It's my birthday party. When are you going to open it next week? Well, then I'm going to advise you in a slightly different direction. Right. Uh, and that's where when people talk about that vintage is superior, if you take a red wine parallel, for example, you know, when I, I love Bordeaux and I love Burgundies and people say, well, you know, I don't know, 2015 is a great vintage. Well, let's be clear. That's going to be a terrible vintage to drink for the next 10. Right. It will be great in 20 years. But if you don't have 20 years, maybe you want to look at a 12, which is right. arguably a smaller vintage, but you have a great time drinking it now. So people need to learn that, that, when people pitch, this is an amazing vintage. Ideally, you know your taste because if you don't like it in secondary tertiary aromas, arguably doesn't matter. And ideally, you know roughly when you want to drink it. Because if you don't know that, I, I think it's, it's marketing more than true inherent quality. Right. No, I mean, and it's all and all those notes that are given or people are commentary. It's often on release or right after release. And they're not they're not tasting it necessarily. I mean, all the top like your wines, people will taste over many, many vintages or in past vintage, back vintages and, and update their notes. But a lot of places they'll, they'll give you a review and score it. But then it's a snapshot in time or it's even a barrel sample in the case of like Bordeaux that we were just talking about. And it's it's not exactly the same wine. The, the problem we have actually on, on the notes is. I mean, I, well, it could appear to be a little critical, and it kind of is. <laughs> it's um, okay, go for it. Champagne critics tend to gauge a vintage based on the first, champ first house to release their vintage. Mm. I'm not sure that's the best benchmark. Uh, that's the first thing. And also, by the time we release, we're too late. People have forgotten. By the time I release my eight, people will be drinking 15, I think. So, right. but does it matter? Uh, to me, not, it matters if I want it to sell to the masses, but on the whole, people, we have very loyal people following these cuvées. Uh, we find, and we're delighted that they are loyal. That means they, they like it. Um, and therefore, on that basis, it's less of a problem. I think it is a little disappointing, though. What we know, and the reason why I think we won the tasting of the millennium is because our wine have a, an aging potential, which is much greater than the average, for sure. Right. And that comes back to our cold fermentation and that comes back to the long aging on lees, which I think make um, cuvées even from the 70s, even from just that method, make the, will make the wine peak later. The problem for me and the consequence for me is I need to release later. But for you, it's not a problem because you won't be able to access it before. Well, and, and that's a, a lot of people talk about uh, champagne, especially even on the vintage champagne being actually a really... Um, you know, high quality for price ratio because you're you're someone like you. You're aging the bottle for so long for us, and yep. it's got it's got perfect provenance, of course. And you're and you're and you're checking it before you're releasing it. And so, you know that for you to there's a huge financial investment for you to sit on these bottles for 11, 12 years. Yeah, but that's the advantage of being two hundred year old. You know, you inherit one hundred right. and ninety eight and. And therefore, you only need to invest the increment. Otherwise, and that's, that's a difficulty with some of the growers who are great winemakers, don't get me wrong, but it takes ages to get to um, aging in your cellar. It takes ages to build a memory in your reserve wines. It takes ages to build a worthwhile solera. It takes a huge amount of time. And, and it's, not a, it's not a criticism of people that don't have that history is fundamentally we are 200 years old we've never been resold to another family or rerun and therefore that quality line has never been broken which means that i narrow huge reserves and and clearly i benefit from it there is no question i've done nothing for it i don't deserve any credit but the house deserves credit for having kept that that dna great uh, that's interesting so and in terms of um vineyard holdings and viticulture so you do own about 15 hectares or so of vines is my understanding yeah we it's a little bit more complicated than that um 
us through different shareholder structures, we own about 100. Okay. okay? More importantly, on top of that, we run 150, 140 hectares um, of other landowners. So roughly, we control, um, we control about two thirds of what we need. As in, but by I mean control, I mean my guys that are paid by us will control pruning. Uh, and and you basically you, you you own it. You just the land itself isn't yours in your possession, but that yeah. that product you it's own like it the cycle. It's like a lease or a management right. contract. But fundamentally, we control what matters. We control how the plant grows, and the others. The balance is made of long-term supply contracts from families we've been working with for ages. Um, and frankly, if we trust them to be part of our extended family, this means they work the vines as well as we frankly do. And we determine the harvest date on the entirety. Got it. Uh, I don't buy steel wine. I don't buy, I only buy grapes. Um, so that concept of negotiation, I think is a bit of a nonsense and will erode over time. Um, of course, we don't own the entirety of the land, but I'm not sure it matters that much, frankly. Right. No, I mean, I think that it, also with the price of the land to be able to acquire a hectare at a couple million dollars or a couple yeah, million euros. Yeah, so. frankly, I would, rather, I would rather run an hectare in the right spot than own one in a lower tower. Right. Uh, we buy land. I know that was one of your questions. We do buy land. Uh, we bought not far from five hectares over the last three years in the Grand Cru, particularly in the Grand Cru of Chardonnay, in villages like Chouilly and Cramont. Um, and largely they were, I don't want to say transaction, they are relationship with families that you strengthen over time. And sometimes one needs money and the other has some and, and we further strengthen these relationships that way. Right, and there's also generational change and yeah. uh, inheritance laws are not the nicest in France. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. that's the reason why we, we need to help sometimes. But we, even sometimes we, we, we bought the land, but we let them run it under different, it, all of that is, is sharing of the economics, but fundamentally in terms of controlling the quality of what's in your bottle, which is really what I care about, right. and making sure what, what's going in is really worthy of having a bill car label. I'm very comfortable with the current equilibrium we've got. So there was a, a question in the comments. Uh, there was two, actually. Uh, the top selling cuvee in the U.S., would that be the Brut Reserve? Yep. Okay. Right. And in, any, in all markets, it's the Brut Reserve, because that's the one we make the most of. Got it. So, so that's like, that's like your, your business card, essentially. You, if you get the Brut Reserve, you know what you're talking about. You, I don't know. It depends. I, but if, the one we're most famous for is Brut Rosé. Let's, let's be clear. The one which I think the most widely known, if you say to somebody... Give me the name of the cuvee at Bill Carcelmont. I would say eight out of 10 people will say Brut Rosé, even if they haven't tasted it. Then depending on the level of knowledge of people, some people will say, ah, wine of the millennium, Nicolas Franchement, right. or will say Elisabeth Salmon. Uh, and then depending on, on personal taste, when you get to what I would call educated educated taster and some of the names here I recognize believe me they are very educated yeah. tasters will say well actually I really like the Brut de Bois or I really like something else but if you build by volume Brut Reserve by far I think notoriety in people that know less about Champagne Brut Rosé because I think it has more of a lifestyle profile and the real wine collectors Nicolas Francois Elisabeth Salmon Louis Salmon potentially I'd say and, uh, yeah Nicolas saint that. And Clos saint -Hilaire. but that's even smaller. Yeah. It's a, so in terms of Clos saint -Hilaire, that is 100% a state that is a monopole, basically. You guys, like everything, old vines it that you guys... The family, it used to be the family's orchard, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, we owned it. We owned it before it was a vineyard. Okay. We've owned it for as long as I think the house has been there because it's in the title of land. It's, it's actually part of the ownership of the, the house. Oh, not, not the vineyard element, the actual house. Interesting. Okay. And in terms of, um, uh, so let's talk a little bit about vintages and in, in terms of, because uh, we're going to taste these 2000, like, what is your impression? Like, what is your high level take on the 2006 versus 2002 vintage? Like, how would you classify these two vintages? Oh, that, um, in headline terms, 2002 is a blockbuster vintage. Um, Possibly one of the strongest one of my lifetime. Um, I, I, I give him many similarities with 96, 
mm. without having the austerity of 96. So it has a strong acidic backbone whilst uh, having some fruit in its early years because I think that's a vintage that will go very, very far, but actually is reasonably pleasant early, which wasn't the case of 96. Um, and 2006 is a crowd pleaser. So it's, it, it feels much more mature and gourmand and rich than, as 2002. I think it is underrated for its aging potential and therefore I give him a similarity to 98. So sometimes when people wonder about the potential evolution of one versus the other, I get them to taste uh, what well, I did that in New York. I think some of the guys were there where I showed a 2006 next to a 98 and it's very rich, but actually the acidity doesn't fade as much as people think they do. Right. I think in, in other very well-known houses, it has, and therefore it has gained the reputation for a wine that won't age. I don't buy it. I don't think it will age anywhere near as long as O2, but do you really, how many people are going to drink the O2 in 20 years? 3% of the people that drink it, that buy it. And therefore, my, my advice generally, other than the technical stuff, which we can come back to, is if you're going to drink your champagne in the next five years, arguably potentially 10, bio 6, I think bang for your buck is amazing. O2, if you are either a purist, a wine geek, and I mean that with the greatest respect because I yep. consider myself to be one. Um, I took it as a compliment. <laughs> then, then, and, or, and or if you're going to decant it and all that kind of jazz, or drink it in 20 years, buy O2. Got it. But things play at the margin and, and for us, it's always at the margin because we, we don't release very often, but you see the gap, but there was no three or four or five. We don't right. release that often. Um, I think- Did you not make those vintages or uh, is it, or are you, or you just not, haven't released them yet? So it, it depends. For, for Nicolas Francois to be, to be, uh, sorry, to be, um, to end up on your table, uh, quite a few things need to happen. First, the harvest need to look good enough in terms of the grapes for us to even consider it. So we're going to taste the base wines and based on that, we're going to think, is it Nicolas Francois year, Elizabeth Salmon year, Louis Salmon year potential? Um, if it looks like there is potential, we are going to make an attempt at blending it. At that stage, uh, even a year that looks interesting, we may not feel like we can get the balance. Mm. Okay. Let's assume we do. So already you've lost quite a few years there. Let's assume we do. We're going to bottle it. The quantity we will bottle will vary depending on the yield, what we think is reasonable, because we're going to taste it blind without knowing the quantity potential. That's a bit geeky, but that's the yeah. way we do it. We don't have the numbers in front of us. Otherwise, we think, well, we think, I think it will. Our, our head will say, hold on, that one is open almost as good and we can do twice as much, you may get tempted. We don't have the numbers when we decide. So that's easy. Um, what, what is, I think, becoming quite unique is even if it's bottled, we will do every year uh, a vertical of the entire cellar. And potentially we will downgrade certain vintages. Um, so in my, since I've took over, we have downgraded 11. So that was bottled and that won't get released. I've downgraded Claw 04 because when you taste them blind, you tend to see the poor cousin. You tend to see the weak one. And sometimes in your tasting, you're, gonna, you're either going to feel this is great. You're going to feel that one isn't there. And it can be sometimes, you know, okay, it's not there because it's 2015 and we're going to release it in eight years time. So you know, it just needs time. We've, yeah, we've got we've got time to downgrade it, and who knows what will happen over that time period. But eleven certainly was one of the year where we felt, at the time of the harvest, I wasn't there. We felt we, it was doable. It was on paper, and a lot of houses have released eleven. Um, but the, the the words of my great uncle was, Mathieu, you can't put a Elizabeth Salmon label on this. No way." And therefore, then you, ha you hire some guys, we take the guys, poof, they, poof the, they pop the cork, put it back into a tank. If it's close to Saint-Hilaire, you, you, we, we're probably going to be using it in some reserve wine liquor style. Got it. Um, if it's Elizabeth Salmon, it's going to the distillery because you can't make anything with the old rosé. So, 
Okay, but so that's, you, part oh, so of, you... that's part of that's, that's part of the guarantee you buy when you buy Bill Carson Moore. You know that the the tasting committee has put its seal of approval. No, oh, no worries. You're not downgrading uh, something that could, was uh, intended for the Cuvée Nicolas Francois into the Brut Reserve. You're just yeah. you're just you know doing something else with it. No, and well, that's one of the th one of the reason why vintage Cuvée, our entry level vintage Cuvée, doesn't have the same bottle shape. Got it. So so this is technically not possible. <laughs> Um, because no, I think we just accept that sometimes we get it wrong. Um, we try not to, because it's not a pleasant experience if you have to. Yeah. Um, however, our um, we feel our reputation for producing what we consider exceptional wines, or certainly in these labels, is worth more than trying to gain a few quid by selling, you know, five thousand, ten thousand bottles. Um, because long, if you think short term, that might be good. But uh, my objective, you know, I have a 30 year vision for the business. Because, well, yeah, about 30 years or 25 years, because that's about the timing where I should be able to handle hand the company to the eighth generation of the family. And if right. that's the case, then it's going to blow up on my watch anyway. So, and frankly, you don't want either to blow it on your watch of your son or your cousin or whatever. So you think very differently to the normal head of a house who, frankly, after retirement, is taking the cash and he's done. Yeah, it's, it's different when you're trying to preserve that legacy for, for, for multiple generations down the road. Sure. Uh, so, um, so let's go into, uh, so let's go into uh, the actual wines and start talking about like, how they're made. And, and what, which one do you want to start with tasting? The 06, I'm assuming? Yeah, why not? Sure. So, so um, yeah, I've got the same. Okay. So, um, how it's made. So, it will come, uh, first thing is the, the vines. So, we don't have dedicated parcels to, um, we don't have dedicated parcels to Nicolas Francois necessarily. Um, we taste every single parcel blind at the still wine stage, base wines. A lot of parcels tend to be the same over the years, but we don't assume they will be because sometimes you have micro challenges in terms of the climate and, and, and raft of different things. So we taste and we decide. When we taste the base wines, and that's true for all the cuvées at Bioca um, we, um we start to imagine where it could go. So the first taste is, is it going to be Bioca or not, or do we sell it down or whatever? Then when it stays in, in the house, we decide and we say, okay, where is that going to go? Florent does his job mainly. We give him some opinions, but he's, he's a master. He does this. Then he does blends. And he presents to us blind, typically six samples at a time. Um, we don't know the crew. We don't know the, well, we don't know the crew. We don't know the uh, blend, although it tends to be similar. But he presents to us different samples. Sometimes he present, presents a 58, 42, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we taste. Um, it's very rare we agree on the first iteration of the blend because we will all write down our feeling for the mouth and nose, etc. And we talk one at a time. One person, one vote. Um, and then we'll say potentially the first one. We'll say, look, we like the freshness of number six, the strength of number two, and what have you. And we will iterate three, four times, possibly more, until we get to a state where we agree with the blend. If we don't agree with the blend, or if we don't feel actually by blending, sometimes one plus one is an equal three, is equal 0 0.5, then we won't do it. But that's how we go about it. Bilk, however, the Nicolas Francois, when flan, it seems that the 60-40 is a good balance. We t the wine tends to find its balance. It's quite a traditional blend of prestige cuvee uh, and you tend to find similar crew makes their way in so for pinot noir maroy because we like maroy mm -hmm. aïe uh, verzonnet ambonnet verzi tend to be the crew that get the most of in pinot noir and for chardonnay for us it's easy because we that's where we have our holdings uh, and you won't put anything other than grand cru chardonnay is going to be chouillé avis cramant menil However, the proportions of one and the actual identity of each parcel is going to vary. 
Also, what's going to vary is the percentage of wine that have been vinified in barrels. But we don't know that. We choose right. on a sample. We choose on a, on, a, on a glass. Because ultimately, that's what I keep telling people around the world. And I, nobody buys technical sheets. That's right. bullshit. Right. I think they all, well, I want it to be this. Nobody does. It's a curiosity. You might like the idea, but you may not like the wine. And ultimately, I sell wine. Right. And I want the wine to be very good. Um, so we do that, we bottle it, and then the aging on lease is going to vary based on these verticals. Where do we feel it's released? It's not always sequential, so we released uh, 2000 before 99, and we sometimes change the order. And then the last step of the process is the dosage, uh, which we also do blind, because we put as much care in that last centiliter to yep. the, la the previous 74, and actually it varies a huge amount. And we do mini blends, People think a lot about dosage in terms of sugar levels. I don't think it's as anywhere near as important as people think it is. However, doing a Chardonnay blend, a Chardonnay reserve wine with a bit of sugar or a Pinot Noir vinified in oak barrels is going to completely change the structure of your wine. And we're going to iterate until we agree. And then once we've agreed, after this gourdment, typically for a cuvee like this is minimum six months before it's shipped. Got it. And so uh, I found, especially with, with, with uh, the larger houses that are uh, in their entry level wines, they, they basically, when you buy those wines, if you open it right away, it's, it's, it, it's not ready. It's not fully integrated with a lot of times with the dosage and things like that. So I, but you guys age an extra six months, but in general, when people buy your Brut Reserve, would your preference be that they sit on another couple months or is it ready to go? No, because I know they don't. Even if they say they yeah. do, they don't. Yeah, so, yeah. So, we, so you have we, to make it ready. So we have taken our responsibility um, because um, I think there was a time when we did and, and inevitably people said, well, it wasn't as good. When did you drink it? Following day. Oh, I told you. <laughs> However, I think a few, the very small producers can get away with it at the moment for some reason. Um, for us, we frankly, based on the amount of aging I've got in the cellar, six months is a rounding error. So we've now, we've now put um, sort of, it's a separate system, basically. It has to be, it can't leave before six months. But and sometimes it's more than six months because, and that's where it's a level of tasting that, that Florent does because there's another level. Aging on lees and aging post disgorgement actually give you very different characteristic. So that's the reason why I don't agree when people say, well, I'm going to finish off the aging in my, in my uh, cellar you are going to trigger a different type of aging, but your wine is not going to age the same. It's not the same to do release a wine after three years and you age it five years than mm. aging it in my cellar for seven and a half years and shipping it after. We have tried. We have done the trials for, for three plus two and, and on five plus one. We've done all of this. It's not the same. Aging on lees gains, gives um, a level of complexity and and weight and um something that that aging in your cellar can't do aging in your cellar starts triggering the aging the normal aging the phasing right. of primary secondary surgery aging on lease doesn't Boulanger knows that that's the reason why they do a difference between gordane and uh and and rd uh, but i think people thinking they're buying a young wine to aging in the cellar is the same as aging on lease is not true the problem is you have to pay up for the long aging only. So I understand right. the economic reasons why, you know. Yeah, I mean, and then if you look at uh, Dom Perignon there, if you taste the, the vintage Dom Perignon versus the P2, you notice there's a freshness quality difference uh, for something that has been aged after, not on the lees for that for that period of time um, versus that. So it's, yeah, the, the, the lees definitely like, protect the, it and keep it fresh. You got the, you same wine in the first place, but that's another Sure. That, yeah, that's a, a very large production scale. <laughs> so, um, um, so, so there was talking a, about there is a que there is a question on. Sorry. Go ahead. I got it. Uh, Can it be used? Does it make the cut? Can it be used for reserve wines? Yes, potentially. Potentially, it can. Um, in the in the case of uh, Nicolas Francois or Louis Salmon downgrade, it can go into reserve wine. For Elizabeth Salmon, it's a little harder because I'm not sure what a reserve wine I would be using it for, because it wouldn't fit the Brut Rosé style. But technically, yes. Um, 
and if we think is worthy. Look, when we downgrade a, a vintage, it's because we have very, very high expectations. The wines haven't gone bad. They just, 2011, we couldn't get away from the vegetal aftertaste. I think that's the problem of that vintage. We had it. We just had the courage not to show it to people. But... Got it. Sorry, you were asking a question. Oh, no, no, it's okay. Uh, I wanted to get those as well. Um, in terms of, um, so we talked about the, uh, the, we talked about the cold settling. We talked, um, so barrel versus stainless steel. So stainless steel, something you guys switched over to in the sixties, you've now started going back. And one okay. thing I noticed at least on the, is that there's maybe a little difference in terms of barrel, but what I'm hearing from you is that when you're tasting, you're not look, you're not making the wine to have this much barrel. It's more of like the final blend that you've chosen blind. It is what it is. And, 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 and your chef de cave is basically, you know, d making trials on different things. He tells us, we only know what's in the wine when we've agreed it is the wine. Interesting. There is no, certainly there are, I think, extremes or types of blends he would not go into because he knows it won't age. But the decision is absolutely made blind. Mm. We don't know. So why? And it's the same thing for the dosage. You know, why is the 2006 at 6 gram and 2002 at 4 gram? Because better. there is absolutely no other reason why. Um, there is no, fundamentally, the taste guides us and when we do different disgorgement and we now put the disgorgement date on these cuvées, because I know some people age them, you will get potentially different dosages depending on when they've been disgorged. Because for every disgorgement, you have a date, yeah? You have a date on your... Yeah, yeah. This, uh, the 2002 yeah. was 2016. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we will, for each disgorgement, we will recheck the dosage and potentially adapt it. So I think the, there's been two of 2002 and the, the, the blends of dosage. I mean, we're talking at the margin, but they're different. Interesting. Okay, so, so you, you actually can change the dosage for, for different releases then? Because you're tasting it slightly different because your expectation is that 97% of the customers are gonna buy this and, and drink it in a very short window. For 06, yes. For 02, I've told them not to, then they can listen or not. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, or, or, or if you decant it, or if you open it early. Um, but we'll see, you know, you, you see in 06, 06, you've opened 06, right? Yeah. Okay. So 06, for me, it's a very traditional Nicolas Francois cuvée. Um, and I mean that as a compliment. Where well, I was definitely getting yeah. like, a, like a roasted nut on the like a grill, like a Marcona almond, those kind of like a slight, almost like a slight bitter almond to it in a good way. Um, but it's, it's definitely needs time to come down. But and I also noticed the body seems to be a little bit lighter on the 06 than the 02. The 02 just seems a little bit more uh, yeah, it's, rounder. It's more, it's more dense. O, O2, um, for me, it feels like there is more Pinot, but there is not more Pinot. It's just the characteristic of that Pinot. Um, you know, the, the harvest, I looked at the, at the stats and, and what really differentiate one harvest over the other because ultimately we don't really know why, why a vintage is different to the other other than they taste different. You know, they were both on the stats, similar degrees of alcohol um, potential. Um, the degree levels were around 10 for us, 10.2, acidity around 7 grams. It was not... On the technical sheet, you wouldn't say that much difference. The, the difference that we, we can see and actually it makes sense when you taste the wine is the, it got really warm during the harvest of 06. Um, and whilst they were both harvested back end of, of September or second part of September, you feel the heat of 06 more than you feel 02. 02 feels colder, more austere. And that translates into a slightly higher pH level for the technician amongst you in 06 and in 02. But that's, that's technical ch sheet chat. And right. fundamentally, I don't want our wines to be made as a technical sheet. That's good if you're trying to do it like a, an industrial approach. And that's everything I don't want to do. I want to do every parcel individually. I want to do it in scale for my entire production. But every single parcel is vinified individually. 
or at least every individual crew, we will decide on tank by tank basis whether we make malolactic fermentation or not. We will decide at the harvest what goes in the stainless steel, what goes in the, in the barrels. It has to be handcrafted. But we benefit from a reasonable scale. I mean, it, in the scale of champagne, we're tiny. Yeah? But right. compared to a tiny grower, of course, we're bigger. And therefore, we can play on more parcels. And therefore, it's like a kid's in a, in a candy shop. I have more sweets. And therefore, I can get the best sweets in, in bottles like this. So when, you, when you're aging on the leaves, does, does cork versus crown cap play a factor? Have you guys done experiments or are you all crown cap? So, uh, no, we do from time to time aging. So on average, certainly for the non-vintages, um, we would do uh, the, the steel caps because they conserve the purity. And, and we, you know, finesse, elegance, and balance doesn't come with an overly oxidative style. So, but we do from time to time do it uh, on cork. That's a decision we make after the blend. Got it. Um, in these two I checked, they were, they were crown caps. Because I asked Florent and he said, look, there were vintages that were pure, they were mature. And, and by putting them into, into a cork, what you're going to do is overripe them. All of this is very helpful if you're trying to release early. Because right. I'm going to give you the impression that the vintage is, is ready early. Not you, but I think the average. <laughs> the average, per, yeah. It's the same thing with second press. You know, people use second press. Why? It feel, or it feels richer, it feels riper. Yeah, okay, it feels that, but fundamentally it isn't that. So it's makeup and means your wine will fall over uh, sooner. So we do it from time to time. It's decided cuvee by cuvee level. There is nothing systematic. Uh, we have to challenge ourselves. That's the thing that we've put in, our, in, our, um, in the team's DNA is the family motto is give priority to quality and thrive for excellence. That means everything and that means nothing. What that means is every day, we're challenging ourselves to do better. And you can't challenge yourself to do better if you keep using the same approach. You have to look, we have very skilled team, they're amazing team, they love the house and we love them. And they look at it and they say, Mathieu has told me we need to make better wines. And if, if they say, okay, this time we need to do it with cork, fine, yeah. no problem. But don't tell me you're doing it because that's the last time, we, last time we did it that way. Because if it's not the right answer, I'm not interested. I want an amazing one. Tell me how to do it, and I will give you all the money in the world to do it. I like that approach. Um, so this 06 is drinking really on a lot of finesse. Uh, I do get that kind of like uh, chalkiness on the finish. Um, that kind of marzipan turns into like a chalk kind of note. Um, I do get uh, the quince and the apple, a little bit of pear. But I also get um, a little bit of like a, like, a, like a slight plum or cherry note in there as well, and probably from the Pinot Noir. But this is really young, very fresh, uh, and, and it's odd to say it's really young for 2006. Uh, but it's like, you know, and, and in terms of age worthiness, like this obviously can age for quite some time. But what do you think is the ideal drinking window for this 06? So that depends on your taste. And I think we, we need to do some work with you guys to help you knowing how they evolve. My personal taste is I like wines in their secondary drink, early in their secondary drinking windows. So I don't like the honey, heavily concentrated, deep yellow champagne. Right. I respect people that do, but it's not my style. I like when, I call it in my head, when they start to break. When they start to turn a bit richer. And it's the same thing when I like to drink red wine. But I want to feel there is years to go. I don't like the peak. I think that peak, supposedly, that you lose the acidity thing, it's not for me. And it's the same thing in super mature red wines. When, when the backbone is gone, I feel like I'm playing with a dead body. I'm not interested. It needs to be something that still has tension. Right. Uh, I think 06 will get there. 06 is not far off that, in my personal opinion, and will stay there for quite some time. 02, so I have two cellars at home. I have the deep cellar and I have the cellar where it's accessible, when the non-vintages are. And basically, I drink 06 and the 02, they're far away. Got it. They, they are far away. You can cheat, you can decant it, you can leave it in that glass for two hours and you will accelerate time. But you're pretending. Not quite the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're pretending. Yeah, yeah. So, are you a fan of decanting champagne? Uh, I know I'm Max Riddell. I'm a fan of drinking it. exceptional wines, and therefore, okay. it's, a mean, it's a means to an end. 
it looks cool. You know, you do it at you do it at a dinner party with the right wine. It looks nice. That helps in the right context. Um, and fundamentally, it helps you gain two three years. So I was at a I was at a restaurant. Um, when was it Tuesday in Paris? A good friend of ours, uh, Thomas Boulot, a Michelin star chef, and he served me blind because he was in the Bill Carcaraf, Nicolas Francois Outou. It was amazing. It was amazing. It was very, very good. Uh, I wasn't sure it was Outou because he knew we were coming and he served it a bit before. So it certainly works. It's not just a gimmick. It, it works and it has an impact. Is it for everybody? I don't know. I think your level of knowledge and your level of appreciation of what you need to be a bit of a wine geek, I think, to see the difference. Yeah. Um, well, I'll but, be decanting this later. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but I tell people to try because they say, well, I won't be able... I, I meet a lot of people who say, well, I can't tell the difference between, between good wine and bad wine. I say, that's bullshit. I said, do you prefer broccoli to carrot? Well, I prefer this. Okay, so then you have taste buds. Good. Therefore, you, you can, you, for your own um, taste, you can define what's better for you. I, I hate it's very difficult to impose your taste on people. I think right. marketing is pretending we must impose our taste. This is the best champagne. Is it? I don't know. It may be the best champagne for me. It's not for you. Our, we are a supporting act in the moment of happiness. We, we, we can't. Our job is to educate, try and do something which is really, really good. But the difference between really good and the best for you is a very personal choice. And that's the reason why we have 11 cuvées. We know that. We know that some people will be loving rosé no matter how good a Nicolas Francois you put in front of them. And the reverse can be true. And is there anything wrong with it? Is one taste bud superior than the other? No. It's about pleasure. So what is the thing that gives you the greatest kick? What's the thing you say, I'm really loving this? I, 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 it creates an emotion. I, I want to create an emotion. The rest, the technical sheet and all of that. Yeah. Uh, so that's so, easy. To, it's easy to do, and I'm not interested. So there's a question. Will decanting lose the effervescence in the wine? Yes, at the margin. Not as much as you think. So we are not at it's the same thing for when I've, I've opened champagnes and put them in, put them in the fridge for uh, a day or so. And as long as you put a good closure, you'd be surprised that it doesn't really change it. it so let's requalify that for me. For us, no, because we are, we are not a big bubble, um, a lot of gas champagne. Because our, our wines, even the non vintages are age a lot longer than the average and therefore they never Whereas they are bubbly, you can see the bubbles, they're never very, very so, effervescent. Yeah. So already the benchmark is lower. Um, but no doubt they do. And, and if you are the kind of person that really love when there is strong effervescence, then don't decant. That goes back to my point on personal taste. They do, but not as much as you think. They certainly don't go flat. Um, and when we talk about decanting, we're talking about decanting 20 minutes. We're not talking about, you know, the red wine decanting that you leave there for half a day. No. Right. No. Which also plays out when you do it. If you do it when you're drinking it on your own, you better drink quick. Uh, if it's six people, it's one glass each. No. It also plays in what glass you use. This, this is a half decanter, you know. Um, but again, you know, I tell people, leave it in your glass before you drink it. Nine times out of ten, they finish. They finish drinking the glass by the time I finish my sentence. So it's not. It never works. Yeah. The decanting accelerates and makes sure that actually by the time they drink it, they're drinking it in a good in a good position. Yeah, it's it's hard to overcome consumer behavior. Um, so there was one quick question. So if you wanted to get your brute reserve, your current release brute reserve, into the same kind of secondary drinking window that you mentioned for these wines, how long on average would you age? No, so I don't want to drink my Brut Reserve in a secondary drinking window because it's not designed for that. Got it. We're talking Nicolas Francois and Louis Salmon uh, for, for my personal taste. Uh, Elizabeth Salmon, I drink it uh, when we release it. We have got the 2007 out right now. That's a 13 years old rosé. It doesn't need any more time. Got it. If you like it, 
particularly if you're a rosé drinker like me, I drink rosé because I think it brings a level of fruitiness and spiciness that I don't get in the white. The fruitiness you will lose if you age. The spiciness you will gain. And the complexity and the vinosity you will gain. But if I want a Venus style, I drink Nicolas Francois Auto. So I, I, we have some, some private uh, friends and clients that love aging Elizabeth Salmon. And they've said, oh, we must try together, Mathieu, 1980 something. I respect it, but it's not to my personal style. So right. for me, Elizabeth Salmon, Elizabeth Salmon 07, the one we have right now, I drink it now. I think it's amazing. And it, for my personal taste, it won't get better. Well, I am going to go find a bottle after this uh, and, and get you one of those. Try, because... Honestly, it's a, it's a very good one, and 07 is an underrated vintage. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was talking with uh, 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 Clement, and he was saying that the 07 was really good. Um, and so uh, let's jump into the 02. So, um, yep. and, in terms of, because I don't want to run out of time and cover um, this, because this so is from O2, a. 02, similar, more. Um... So 60-40, 60% uh, Pinot Noir, 40% Chardonnay. More oak barrels, 20% oak barrels. I think the acidic backbone, if you, it's like playing the game after the party. You know, it's easy to give explanation after. Yeah. But because it feels a little more austere in its early years, and obviously the wood gives it oxidation. So mm -hmm. it makes sense to have a bit more. Well, six felt richer, what do you want to add richness to a rich wine? doesn't make much sense. Um, the, the disgorgement date you said on yours was 16. 16. Mine is January 16. Yeah. So it's been on, on lease for 14 years. I think it's pretty good going. Um, and the dosage is low at four grams. So we call them brut, not to confuse people, but now a lot of our prestige QV are extra brut because maturity levels have increased and we don't feel, um, we don't feel like uh, the, the sugar helps. And I think that's one of the things that the house has made good progress over the last... Oh, it froze. Has made good progress over the last five, six years is the, um, the mini blends in the reserve wines we put in the liquor. When they explained that to me first, I was thinking, you, you must be joking, right? You're dealing with half a centiliter difference. But... First, they got me to taste, and you can see big differences. And Florent's explanation is a great one, or Denis' explanation is a great one. Is If you finish off a scallop with curry, it's going to taste like a scallop with curry. If you finish scallop with mint, it may still be a scallop, but it's going to feel very different. And it's the same thing with dosage. At the moment, the, the, the I would say the mainstream view is if there is a lot of sugar, they're trying to hide something. Bullshit. Bullshit. I think if the wine gets its balance at 8 grams, let it have 8 grams. Yes, it's going to feel closer to the wine when you bring it down. Is it a good thing? I don't know. Is it a good thing to see me with no makeup in the morning? I'm not sure. You know, I don't know. It doesn't necessarily... What you also have to know is between zero and four, your palate is incapable of tasting sugar. So it's about balance. However, what people don't talk about and what we invested very heavily into is these mini blends. Do you do a barrels vinified Pinot Noir or finish off with Chardonnay? That's one of the things that triggered our change of extra brut to brut nature is we changed that. And that really changed at the margin um, the, the taste. Yes, the majority of the wine may be the same, but the final taste, that little bit of finesse that you're trying to gain, we gain it through that. But it's a work of precision, and it's a work of patience, and it's a work of making sure you originally have invested in your, your reserve wines. Yeah, so there, there's definitely like a that kind of like grilled nut, like our bitter almond note, more so than on the 04, or on so the 06. And, and, and I'm assuming that that's part of it is related to the, the higher, per, uh, higher percentage of oak um i think the year the year, the, or the year? Is, okay i think a lot of it is 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 more in the year i think than in the vinification method because we have a view on what we want nicolas francois to be got it you know, we have memory that my first memory of champagne the one that made me love champagne is nicolas francois so we all have in the family expectations of what nicolas francois has to be and therefore we I think we mold 
things to be able to get to that expectation. Um, but I think the year has a lot to play for you. Even with guys that play the technical sheet game, if you take their O2 next to O6, even if it's Vinny for exactly the same way, same percentage, O2 is a year of great power, yeah. great length. I mean, if you keep that wine for a long time. Yeah. For us, I think one of the characteristic is the coffee note. You know, the, not the coffee, the drink. The, the grounds. The coffee bean. Yeah. The coffee bean. That, that's the way I, I, it, helps re, it helps me recognize it. And I think that ever so slight bitterness at the end, which is normally a good sign in terms of aging potential. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I like that, that kind of coffee ground note as well. In terms of uh, your drinking window, again, for your preference, because we're, uh, we're coming close to the end of the 60 minutes, um, where, how long before you think this gets into that uh, secondary drinking window that you start to like the O2? Is it almost there? No. No. Um... For me, not before five years. Got it. So we're just going to start to drink well in five years. my advice, if, if, if I'm advising myself on my personal taste, I say drink 06. Because I hate drinking potential. Potential is a, is a crime. When people here, here, obviously, we're selling you wines that are ready to drink. But I absolutely, I love winemakers around the world and I meet a lot of them and a lot of them are great friends. But when the guys tell me drink this is full of potential and they, I don't want to die drinking potential. <laughs> I, I want to drink an amazing wine. And in Champagne, we have taken that responsibility. And I think in these two cases, 02 and 06, they are amazing wines, but they have different expressions of amazing wine. And for my personal taste, 06 next five years, 02 review after five years. It's not that, I absolutely love the wine I'm drinking today. I think it's very good, but I know my taste enough to know I will have a lot more pleasure in five years and I have enough 06 at home that I can easily go through this. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to go find that 07 uh, Cuvée Elizabeth. Um, I do want to thank you uh, for taking the time uh, and answering everybody's questions and, and all of my questions, of course. Um, but thank you. This is so information, uh, so educational. I, I, I've learned so much more about how you guys do it at Villacart Salmon, and I totally respect the, the level of quality and uh, intent that you bring into each bottle of wine. It's a real pleasure, and thank you for thinking of us. We're delighted, and if we can help you have a, a good time, that's part, of, that's part of our life. So we're very happy. Well, thank you for doing this. I hope to see you in, uh, in Champagne soon. I hope so. Thanks, okay. everyone. Cheers. Bye-bye.